Good morning, and welcome to the Cross Point Southern Baptist Church Virtual Sunday School class. Thank you for joining us again this morning. I'm your host, Jim Hillier. While we were stuck indoors uh, during the COVID quarantine, many churches uh, have taken to live streaming their services. Well, Cross Point has been serving our shut ins and vacationing members for over three years with live stream services going to YouTube. And now we've added a virtual Sunday school class. Um, every week, our uh, church service goes live on YouTube at 11 a.m. Uh, prior to that, our Sunday school class goes live at uh, 9.45. So, hope you'll join us every week as, uh, as we present God's Word. As far as the materials that we use uh, in our in our class, both our uh, in-person class and our uh, our live stream class, we use a quarterly. Uh, it's a little uh, uh, paper-bound uh, magazine, if you will, uh, that uh, comes out about every three months. It's produced by Lifeway. It's called Explore the Bible. Every month, every three month period, you get a book, sometimes two if they're small, uh, of the Bible that, that gets covered in this material. Uh, this is available from www.lifeway.com slash explore the Bible. And it's available both as a uh, uh, hard print version or uh, as a digital download and a PDF. So you can take it with you wherever you happen to want to go. So this morning, uh, we're in verse, uh, our session 13 uh, for May 24th, 2020. The verses we're looking at today as we uh, come close to concluding our study of the book of Romans is in Romans 14, verses 1 through 12. And uh, the, uh, the material is about accepting and being accepted. So if you would, join me in prayer and uh, as we, uh, we head into the materials and head into God's Word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us together again this week. We thank you for the, uh, the power of the internet that you put in our hands that even when we were unable to get together uh, physically in our classrooms or in our church or our sanctuaries, when we weren't able to be together with whatever body of believers uh, we belonged with, that you provided a way that your word could be shared, that we can share our study time together, and that we can share a virtual fellowship. For it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. So now, uh, let's join me, uh, if you would, in our uh, our virtual classroom. As I said, this week we're looking at uh, Romans chapter 14, verses 1 through 12. If you have, uh, yeah, you have an actual uh, Sunday school book, one of the uh, one of the, the Lifeway uh, books with you, we are toward the back of the book. We're on page 113, starting out. Uh, if you have the virtual version, it also uh, the page numbering in the virtual version goes right along with the uh, the hard copy. So, uh, if you go to page one thirteen, so we open with uh, the, the, you know that believers should be should accept and encourage other believers in you know in, in facing uh, in facing adversity and in. in uh, uh, looking at uh, doctrine, at faith, at belief, in order to facilitate uh, a sense of unity. I recently did a did a sermon on unity, uh, coming out of uh, uh, a lot of the same uh, the same area of the Book of Romans. And the the human body is is quite a uh, quite a uh, creation. It's 
a series of systems, you know, circulatory and digestive systems, skeletal system, nervous system, all working together to keep things moving. You know, uh, a, a business is a, a, a series of systems that are interconnected. The, the human body and the body of Christ, the body of the church, is uh, is, is a series of systems and and methods and mechanisms that are all interconnected. And in order to keep that body healthy, we have to have we have to have a sense of unity. We have to, have, you know, our, our hands, the way that our hands work, all of the all of the joints, all of the muscles, all of the ligaments have to work together. They have to be uh, they, they have to be unified. Now, have you ever seen uh, a breakdown in one part of the body? Uh, the human body, or the church body, or, or any organization, uh, you know, the breakdown of one piece of that body. Have you ever seen that create uh, impacts on other areas? I mean, if you uh, if you look at your, um, oh, let, let's say your uh, uh, your your financial organization uh, in in your church, uh, if if they're not on top of the finances, things can go terribly, terribly wrong. If you uh, if your AV team isn't in sync, if your uh, uh, if your pastor and your your music minister aren't in sync, uh, the, the the just the overall uh, worship experience can can quite quite effectively fall apart pretty quick. <coughs> Excuse me. So starting back in Romans 12, uh, Paul was focusing on on how we live out. Uh, our faith, and uh, you know, we're called to be living sacrifices, uh, to use our gifts to bring glory uh, to God, and to build up the church. Uh, you know, we no, we no longer exist as, as individuals to serve ourselves, but instead, we're in a relationship with with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We're in a relationship with Christ. We're in a relationship with God. We're we are the children. Of God, we have that relationship. Uh, so while we need to choose between God's laws and human laws it, in, in some extreme cases, uh, officials deserve our respect. And you know we have to. We we, we saw this back in in chapter thirteen last week uh, that uh, rebelling against laws and leaders is is rebelling against God who, who put them in place. <clears throat> Sorry, lost lost my lost my, my bookmark there for a second. Uh, so returning to the third theme of relationships, unity within the church uh, is is a little bit is a little bit different. While we're you know we're still expected to uh, to respect each other, we're expected to honor each other, we're expected to uh, to protect each other, and when disagreements arise, uh, we should use the law of liberty and the law of love as our guides to you know, for our attitudes and behaviors. Uh, that's covered in a, in a little bit broader sense in, in chapter fourteen, uh, going all the way from, from verse one to, to twenty three. So as we read through. Um, as we read through uh, chapter 14, verses 1 to 12, uh, look, I want you to look at you know if you're if you're if you're fond of writing in your Bibles or circling things, that's great. If not, uh, get a notepad and 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 read through this and uh, or just just read it. And I want you to circle or write down uh, in, in uh, one column preferences that Paul refers to. And in another column or underlined Bible, uh, look at, focus on the commands that he gives. Now, preferences and commands are vastly different. Uh, preferences uh, are interpretations. They're one person, you know, if you, uh, and I've, I've been trying to break myself of this because it's uh, it's something that it really hit home with me when it, when it was told to me a while back. Uh, if you 
if you hear someone say, I think it means, or I feel that it means, take it with a grain of salt, folks, because it's probably not what it means. That's one person's opinion. Now, if they say, I've read this commentary or that commentary or this scholar or that scholar says or, or uh, most scholars say, then, then, then you can you put some weight behind it. But if you just, if you have just some, somebody says, well, I think that means that's what it may mean to them, but that's not necessarily what it means. Catch yourself. I try to catch myself when I when I do it, and because I, I do, I find myself using that phrase. And the more I think about it, it's, my opinion doesn't matter. The only opinion that, that that matters is God's opinion. What does the Bible say? What does Scripture say? What does God's word given to us say? Excuse me again. I've got a tickle in my throat. So let's start off with Romans chapter 14, verses 1 through 4. And he opens up right here. I'll, I'll, give, you, I'll give you a start up, uh, a leg up on your preferences and, and commands. He starts with a command. Accept anyone who is weak in faith, but don't argue about disputed matters. One person believes he may eat anything, while one who is weak eats only vegetables. One who eats must not look down on the one who does not eat. And the one who does not eat must not judge the one who does, because God has accepted it. Who are you to judge another's household servant? Before his own Lord, he stands or falls. And he will stand because the Lord is able to make him stand. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus spoke about this. He challenged his listeners to avoid judging others. In, in Matthew 7, uh, verses 1 and 2, he says, Judge not that you not be judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. So when you when you come down overly hard on someone's doctrinal belief or someone's uh, uh, you know preference, uh, you know it's 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 not up to you. That judgment of their position and their belief isn't up to you. Now, if it's if it's a case of a uh, of a uh, of a pastor who is blatantly misleading a congregation or blatantly mis misleading the world, okay, yeah, that's not something that, that's not something that that, that, you, that that you shouldn't stand against. But when it comes down to as as Paul said back here in our, our verse in Romans, we, we're not to look down on each other. We're not to judge each other. Because we are, we are answerable for only ourselves. So Jesus was teaching against, in, in Matthew 7, he was teaching against uh, religious hypocrisy that was so common in the day. The hypocrites held others to a standard that they refused to, to, to keep for themselves. And they judged and they turned around and judged others for falling short. If, they, if you didn't obey every tiny little bit of the law as it had, as it had changed for 1,500 years from Moses to, to Jesus, the way that Jewish law had changed, it wasn't the Mosaic law anymore. It was Mosaic law built on and stacked on and piled under with man's laws and regulations and rules. And if you couldn't follow all of it, you couldn't follow any of it. 
You failed. If you failed one piece, you failed the whole thing. So these people were holding others responsible and accountable for something that they themselves could not keep up with. So Paul says here, <clears throat> back in Romans, to accept anyone who is weak in faith. In other words, don't, you know, he was drawing a, a distinction between doctrine, which is truth that never changes, and practice, which is methods that can be altered, adapted, and swung based on, on whoever's currently in charge of the organization. Now, the question here is, we have in, in Christianity, we have many denominations. We have many, I'll say, faiths. We have many doctrines. Some doctrines between various uh, denominations, or as they would have been referred to back in Roman times, uh, back when Paul was writing this in, in the first century, they would be considered sects, S-E-C-T-S. -E Basically, a group of believers that believe one thing, another group of believers that kind of believe the same thing, but not really. And they were often at, at odds with each other. Have you ever seen that today? Have you ever... Have you ever been, had an opportunity to, uh, uh, you know, uh, we are Southern Baptists. You know, if you're, if you're watching, if you're Southern Baptist, have you ever had an opportunity to, uh, to have a really in-depth discussion with, uh, with, with a Catholic about their beliefs? Have you ever had uh, opportunity to talk to, to Methodists or Lutherans uh, about their the, 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 some of the, some of the details, some of the idiosyncrasies of their, of their faith versus what we believe. Well, that's where we get into problems. And that it's nothing new that this problem was going on back in the first century when Paul was writing this. Uh, he, he was, he was focusing on though, the, the weakness he said was, was the, those that don't really understand the gospel. And, and there's, there's, there's one thing that we all have to agree on. If a church or an organization or a person is to consider themselves a Christian, there's one thing that we all have to agree on. And that is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God he was born into a human body. He was crucified on the cross, died as a propitiation for our sin, a payment for what we owe for our sin. He died, and on the third day, he arose and ascended, and he's coming back. That's the heart of all true, immutable doctrine. No matter how anybody interprets anything else, that's that's the one thing that cannot be changed. You know, we have it. We have a tendency as uh, as people and, and 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 often as churches to elevate our personal preferences and our personal interpretations uh, to the level of non-negotiable doctrine. Some uh, uh, you, you run into uh, situations where uh, uh, you know, some, if we if you talk to uh, to Jewish, you know, Sabbath is Saturday. Who says? Who says? Who says what day of the week the Sabbath was? It's one day. One day out of the week, and not just, you know, rotates around, you know, with, you know, whatever day you happen to not want to do something else. So, you no, it's, it is fixed. It has become, it has become in the, in, uh, in, in the, the Christian world, it's become accepted that it's Sunday. 
Nowhere in the Bible does it say Sunday. The, the, the word Sunday, it, it's not there. It's Sabbath. Keep the Sabbath holy. It's the seventh day. What is, what is it? Saturday? Sunday? Eh, could be. But does the specific day of the week make that much of a difference? Other than for consistency and for uniformity and agreement and unity across uh, across the faith? No, it really, it's not, it's not something to argue about. And that's the kind of thing that, they, they, that Paul was highlighting that they were arguing about. He got. He was talking to, talking to them about uh, you know what different people eat. You know that uh, those who uh, uh, were, were ate only vegetables. You know they, they wouldn't eat meat. You know they wouldn't eat because, because to them that was unclean. Uh, you know the in times long past there, there was some meat that was okay to eat. There was there there was some. You know you talk you, you look at uh, uh, again in the. The comparison, and I, I'm not picking on Catholics. I've, I've got Catholic family members. I've got Catholic friends. Uh, don't get me wrong. I'm not. I'm not picking on Catholics. Okay? I'm not saying that they're wrong and we're right or the controversy. But the the whole eating fish on Friday. Some people say you have to. Some people say you only have to do it during Lent. Some people say you do it every Friday. Some people say. What's the point? It's, and again, that is a that is a doctrinal aspect, but it's not something to get hung up on and argue about that could cause disunity. Now he's, he refers in uh, uh, if we go over here to First Corinthians eight one through thirteen, and this is a little bit smaller unless you're on a on a big screen TV. <coughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Damn. That tech list is crazy. Uh, and as is in Rome, you know, he's talking about here that uh, <clears throat> that it, they, the, the church at Corinth was facing the, the same kind of situation. In that congregation, the question related eating meat that had been offered to idols before being sold in the marketplace. It was a it was kind of a it was it was kind of a Process where uh, you know, they, the, the at the temple they the uh, people would come in and they if they didn't have uh, prime spotless uh, pure uh, animals to bring they would buy an animal there and take it for sacrifice and after the sacrifice was done whatever was left got taken over to the marketplace and sold for dinner. And to some, that was okay. To some, that was a problem. You know, they, and they were, they were looking down on each other. You know, some were scolding others for, uh, uh, because of, uh, they were eating. Others were saying, well, you know, Scripture says, and uh, you know, our leaders say that we can eat anything. And, you know, here, right here it says, you know, God says, you know, you, you can eat anything. And it, it was a point of contention there was driving a wedge between the church. The, for the problem is, neither of those approaches was 100% correct. But neither of them could see that they weren't absolutely on the mark. I know everything that there is to know about the law. And come on, Paul, of, of, of uh, any of the writers of the New Testament from a uh, from, from a uh, background perspective, Paul, as he described himself, was a uh, Pharisee among Pharisees, the, the son of Pharisees. He was uh, second, maybe third generation Pharisee. He was he was trained up from early childhood by one of the greatest uh, Jewish teachers of the time. The guy was highly educated in the law. And in faith, he thought what he was doing as Saul of Tarsus, that he was doing it for God. And he he had complete confidence that he was right. Right up until he had Damascus Road experience and Jesus told him, Paul, you're not right. Get right. 
It's time to get right. And he did. He did. He turned around and he and, and he he uh, you know he followed what Jesus was teaching and went down the, the truly right path. And here now he was sharing that information with uh, with the church in Rome. You know, and, and the thing is, we need to focus on being transformed into his likeness and spending less time trying to mold everyone else into ours. You know, instead of making everybody else like us. And I, I tend to do it. Most believers, I think, tend to do it. At some point, they, they decide that they're right or that their pastor is right or that their church is right or their denomination is right. We need to be open to the fact that we are, that none of us are perfectly right because none of us has the absolute mind of God. We have, we have scripture, we have multiple translations of the Bible, we have multiple uh, languages, we have multiple, you know, we have scholar upon scholar upon scholar that, that studies and yet I would, I would say that according to Paul and what he was telling the Romans, none of you are right. None of you are 100% unequivocally right. So, you know, so what, is, what do you think? I want you to, I want you to kind of think for a minute uh, uh, on what are some issues that, that stir debates in the church. Um, you know, to pig or not to pig. What day is the Sabbath? Fish on Friday during Lent. Fish on Friday every Friday. Fish. Why fish? Fishing's fun, but why fish? One of the big ones is dunk, dip, or spritz. That's a, that's always a, that, that's always a good one for conversation. And then, of course, then there's the the dates for holidays. The, the dates for Christmas and Resurrection Day. Yeah. There's a lot of there's a lot of study gone into it, and 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 for for the sake of uniformity, we use uh, uh, you know we, we, we use a, a standard date for Christmas, and for I don't call it Easter, I refer to it as Resurrection Day. Uh, it's a whole other discussion, but uh, moving into uh, Chapter 14, verses 5 through 8. We're told to honor God. One person judges one day to be more important than another. Someone else judges every day to be the same. Let each one be fully convinced in his own mind. Whoever observes the day observes it for the honor of the Lord. Whoever eats, eats for the Lord since he gives thanks to God. And whoever does not eat, it's for the Lord that he does not eat. And he gives thanks to God. For none of us lives for himself, and no one dies for himself. If we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. <clears throat> so, yeah, does, that, does this sound familiar? You know, a lot of questions about days and food. And, you know, in Rome, uh, Jews were ob observing the, the Sabbath along with other other important feast days uh, handed down from the Old Testament. Uh, others in the church considered every day the same. Uh, and that, that group didn't feel any obligation uh, to a religious calendar because, after all, they, you know, they, they said, well, we're not Jews. You know, this specifically being the Gentiles who had accepted Christ. They looked at the Jews and said, "Why should we? Why should we celebrate your day?" And and it was causing that that rift. Now the question of the days is not the point here, though. Not everyone had to believe the same thing on that matter, but everyone had a responsibility to honor God in whatever that decision was that they made, however they were going to celebrate whenever they were going to celebrate. Over in 1 Corinthians 10.31, uh, Paul specifies, therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all 
to the glory of God. So here, now, we've seen, you know, he's talking to the, to, to the church in Rome, but he's he tells the same thing to the church at Corinth. He was telling the same thing because all of the churches, all of the, the congregations, if you will, were having the same problems. They were all facing the same trials. In Romans 6, verses 1 through 11, uh, you know, he, he, again, he's, uh, he, he's talking about the and this is something that we covered several weeks back, uh, that we're to surrender ourselves, we're to give ourselves over to God. Let God run. Don't try, don't try to be the best you can be and be right and have everything right. Trust God, trust the Holy Spirit to guide you and direct you. <clears throat> he says the same thing in, in uh, uh, you know, he states Jesus' ownership, uh, you know, tying it directly to his death and resurrection in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body, and in your spirit, which are God's. God owns us. It's God's decision. And we are, we, we're there for one purpose. We, you know, when it comes down to, uh, to, to Saturday or Sunday as the Sabbath, here, this, is a, this is a good one for you. And this one, this one might step on some toes. Okay. And, Maybe if it steps on your toes, maybe there's a reason for that, okay? But in looking at how we should view God's ownership over us and, and, and how that perspective maybe should and hopefully does change our attitude toward worship. Okay. Plug your ears if you if you if you if you're overly sensitive, but folks, it's not about you. It's not about you. It's not about us going to church, sitting a pew, hanging out with our with our church friends for for coffee and donuts even before or after or whatever. That's not what that's not what it's about. What it's about is we are there for one purpose. Not to have the pastor give us a sermon that's going to make us feel good. Not to have the pastor tell us to live our best life now and, and what kind of what kind of uh, personal improvement programs we could be on to make things better and wonderful and good in our life. No, we are there to worship God. Think about it. Do you go to church? Do you go to church to hang out and see your friends? Do you go to church every Sunday? Sit down in the pew and be all nice and pious and get your Bible out. And, you know, you, you take your Bible with you to church, I hope. And, and, and the preacher comes up and he starts preaching and you flip open and you're following right along. And maybe you're making notes and you get up and you leave. And at some point in time, you say, you know what? I didn't get, my, I didn't get out of the sermon what I thought I needed. I'm not getting out of that church what I think I need. It's not about you. Now, if the problem is that there's something going on in the church, there's something about the church, about the building, the people, what the pastor, whatever, that is causing you to not be able to worship, that's a different story. Because you're not there to get to, to, to be made to feel good. You're not. And I'm, I'm sorry if you think you are, but... Paul's pretty plain about it. Paul's one of the one of the most prolific writers of the New Testament, and you know, considering considering his background, and when he says you know that you're you are owned and that you are there to worship, so our unity in of worshiping is where we should be one. It's where we should be a united church. 
The other, another thing we want to look at, and <coughs> Paul gets into this in verses 9 through 12. It says, Christ died and returned to life for this, that he might be Lord over both the dead and the living. But you, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it's written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow to me and every tongue will give praise to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Don't worry, as, uh, as Paul puts it in, in another verse, uh, uh, you know, we, we, he, he refers uh, to teaching, to Jesus' teachings about the plank in your own eye and the splinter in your brothers. When, you're, when you are that messed up yourself, you're in no place to be telling someone else how, how wrong they are. And we need to, me as well, Every one of us needs to take that to heart. We need to, we need to pay attention to that. You know, Jesus' death and resurrection is, is the unifying factor. It's, like, it's what, I, what I started off with, the, you know, the one, the one immutable truth. You know, Jesus' death and resurrection is the unifying factor. He lived a perfect life. He died on the cross and rose from the dead and has authority over all things. That is the one true core doctrine. That's the one that if if we disagree on that one, we're I guarantee we're going to disagree on everything else. But for emphasis, Paul asked two rhetorical questions. You know, he asked why a weaker believer would judge his brother or sister and why a stronger Christian would despise his brother or sister. And both were happening then, both are happening now. Every day. And to drive home the, his point, Paul refers back to the Old Testament. You know, I want you to think about something for a second. When Paul or any of the, the writers of the New Testament refer to Scripture, what did they what, what were they talking about? They were talking about the Old Testament. That's the only scripture they had. So here, Paul references, kind of, kind of makes a, a, a cross-reference, if you will, back to Isaiah 45, 23. He says, I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return. That to me, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall take an oath. This is God speaking through the prophet Isaiah. And here, Paul uses that, that that reference. And in verse 11, he says, As I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow to me and every tongue will give praise to God. Ultimately, that's what it's all about. Where we are, we are to praise. We are to worship. You know, and and uh, as, we, as we're wrapping up here, <coughs> The uh, he, he makes reference over in Philippians. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. It says, therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Yeah. The Philippians, the church at Philippi had been struggling with that same lack of unity and, and, and having judgmental attitudes toward each other. And Paul was correcting them on all that. And in verses 5 through 11, he writes, 
that Jesus humbled himself on the cross. God raised him above all else. And that every knee shall bow before him and every mouth will confess his authority. There it is again, that reference back to Isaiah. So finally, in, in, uh, in verse 12 of our, of our lesson today, <clears throat> that no one, and we need to understand that no one is exempt. We will each and every one of us answer to God for our actions. Now, if you are a Christian, if you're saved, if you've accepted Christ's gift of salvation, guess what? You're still going to answer. Your, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are covered the blood of Christ, but you're still going to answer to it in a sense. In a sense that, well, did you do this that I told you to? Did you do that that I, not, did, what did you do that I told you not to? But when I gave you direction and I said, go do, did you go do? Did you obey? Did you, did you do the work? Did you run the race? So, I have a, a few thoughts that I want to leave you with. First of all, I want you to consider, which, which do you consider more divisive? Judging others or looking down on others? And they're, they're very, they are very similar. You, know, you might say, well, judging requires looking down or... Looking down is being judgmental. But in Paul's approach, looking down on others is considering yourself higher than you should. Judging others is considering yourself lower than you should. Or you being the, the only one in the room who's right. Have you ever been in a room with a guy that thinks that he is the smartest person in the room and he is convinced that he is the smartest person in the room and no matter how much proof you give him that there's that he's not he is going to walk out thinking he is the smartest person in the room are you that guy just food for thought folks so a couple of final thoughts are you more likely to judge others or to look down on and what adjustments do you need to make based on, on, that, on that thinking and, and on today's lesson? What are some practical ways that you can demonstrate God's ownership over your life? And how can you honor him by honoring someone who is different? What do we need to do? What do you individually and we collectively need to do? And I'm not not talking about the kind of acceptance and tolerance of, uh, of the world, that everything is good and everybody's good and everything's wonderful and everything's nice. It's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about within the church, within a body of believers, within a denomination, what do we need to do to have the spirit of unity? And to be accepting of the small stuff, the things that scripturally are not significant, that they're only significant because we make them significant, that scripturally it's not. And salvationally, it's not that important. Don't let it divide us. Heavenly Father, as we close today, thank you again for your word, for the, the instruction, for how you, you, for these thousands of years that you've used your word to edify and grow your people. Father, we thank you for the ability to be online and to, to share your word. And we pray that you would just keep an eye on all of us, bless us, keep us safe, and bring us together 
as soon as possible. For it's in your Son's name we pray. Amen.